there are three other features that I'd like to bring to your attention. First, prolongation of the QT interval has been known for a very long time. Uh, and in fact, uh, just as Dave mentioned, there are rare Mendelian disorders, there are single gene disorders in which this is a hallmark. And this leads to sudden death, in fact, in a number of syndromes that are abbreviated as LQTS or SQTS for long or short QT syndromes. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about these Mendelian disorders. The genes for these disorders have been uncovered <coughs> over the past 20 years by a variety of both conventional as well as modern genomic and genetic methods. The second is that these abnormalities are not rare. In fact, um, very large studies, community studies that have been done, most of you probably know of the Framingham study in Massachusetts, that if you go in and measure the QT interval of a whole community of individuals and you follow them over time, and you follow what happens to each of those individuals, like has been done in uh, the Framingham study, what you find is there's a very distinct and high correlation between the length of this QT interval and, in fact, increased cardiovascular mortality measured, measured just generally without regard to whether it's sudden death or not because that definition is much more recent. The third feature is even in uh, individuals who are apparently not at risk, we know that QT prolongation occurs uh, from many uh, medications. In fact, the FDA requires that most new medications that are going to be put on the market be tested for their uh, pro-rhythmic, in fact, potential. And exactly why this happens and how this happens, in fact, has been a mystery for a long period of time. So a sum total of at least the first part of many of our genomic studies <laughs> that only became possible within the last five years because of the human genome sequence and variations of the sequence that we know was this protein called, um, of the gene is called NOS1AP and the protein that I'll come to is called KP. And I'm trying to uh, lead you through at least what one cycle of discovery really now entails. So we often start with these kinds of measuring the QT interval from ECGs. As I told you, they can be done in very large numbers of individuals, and they can be done in an automated way quite accurately. So because of that, we can now do studies of the QT interval as well as other medical phenotypes on very large-scale population studies. And if you measure the QT interval, what you'll find is most individuals have a value somewhere here. It has a normal distribution. Some individuals have very prolonged QTs, whereas others have very short intervals. And it's by looking at these individuals, by looking at the QT interval and by measuring genetic markers from uh, DNA taken from their blood that we can do a particular kind of study that I'll come to in which we look through the entire human genome for very common genetic markers that might either increase or decrease in any case that would lead to variation in the QT interval. And very briefly that led to understanding or at least identification of the location for this first gene called nos one ap and of course that's not the end, that's the very beginning of the kinds of studies that genetics implicates, in which we then have to do three kinds of further studies. First, if, Q, if the QT interval is really relevant to sudden death, we've got to find, or rather we've got to demonstrate that these genetic markers impact sudden death, and that's the first thing we did, and I'll tell you the results of that, in fact it does. The second is, if we have a gene, we can manipulate the gene experimentally in the lab in some cellular system so that we can understand what kind of cellular perturbations they do. And the third is we can make mouse models, and of course we can measure the EKG in the mouse, and this sort of completes a cycle in which every single gene that would participate in this trait could be first identified and then moved through the system. So this way in which we can screen the human genome can be applied to any of a number of traits. In fact, over several hundred traits have been studied in this way, as well as disorders have been studied in this way, uh, by looking at genetic markers that either affect the trait in a positive or negative way, 
or increase the value of the trade like in the QT interval. And so there are two kinds of broad genetic or genomic screens we can think of. The first one is variation screens. And the variation screen means that just as our DNA sequences vary, as Dave alluded to, that we're all different at at least 3 million sites in the two genomes we carry, what we're trying to identify from those many millions of variants are the one or the ones that, in fact, when they vary, the trait varies with it. So it's sort of like uh, guilt by association, and that's what the term association means. So when we identify these variants, there are two general class of variants that we distinguish. <coughs> and we distinguish them by frequency because frequency appears to be at least a surrogate that brings up two classes of kind of genetic effects. And the first one, the common variants, I've sort of loosely called the proletariat model. <laughs> and the reason is, it's the same common variants. In fact, it's exceedingly common. Most of them have a frequency about 5% in the general population. So for the QT interval, as you will see, many of us in this room already carry the variant. But individually, each of these variants have a very small effect. And the evidence is not absolutely clear, but the general uh, trend is that many of those variants are regulatory. That is, they don't disrupt the protein or they don't alter the protein per se but they do alter how much of the protein it's made, when it's made, and perhaps where it's made. But the importance comes from the fact that there are many such variants in the genome and they add up to a fairly large effect. And that's how we would explain the trait. The other is the rare variant model, which says there are many, many rare variants at many different genes, and these rare variants individually have a very large effect and can impact Trait. And there's a lot of discussion, argument, if you will, as to which ones are much more compelling reasons by which we are going to explain these common traits. And I'm going to give you some data on the first one, simply because the first studies of genetic variation in the human genome necessarily relied on the common variants because we could study the whole genome, we could catalog these variants and use them in the kinds of studies. <coughs> But DNA sequencing, as you've heard, is now becoming so widespread and cheaper to do that we are now coming to the stage where we can test the second kind of model. The other thing to remember is these are not, these are again only the beginning, there are other kinds of functional screens that can be done. And the idea that a functional screen is in some experimental system, we would disrupt each of the human genes one by one. And we could do this in cells. For example, in cardiac myocytes that can be cultured. Of course, they can be done in animal models, but that's much slower. And there are rare cases where there are specific patients who have a particular mutation. And in fact, there can be physiological studies done on those patients to try and clarify the relationship between a gene disrupting the function of that gene and the kind of traits that it induces. So this is what led to NOS1AP. In fact, it was done by a genome-wide association study in which we first try out or we seek for this association in a limited number of individuals or a small sample, but they're very quickly followed up. And in fact, this finding was in a much larger sample, and I'll come to even larger samples next. And this variant is itself quite frequent. It's got a frequency of about a third. So that's why I remarked that many of us already have, have this variant. And what this does is it changes the QT interval on average by only 5 milliseconds. Now, that doesn't appear to be very large. But when drugs, other drugs, affect, uh, in fact, have some prorhythmic effect, their average effect is of the order of 8 milliseconds. So this is, for a single gene, a fairly sizable effect. 